interview for you with Dr. Ed Fatikoff, who is an internist. Uh, he works in integrative medicine. He's got a lot of information for us about nutrition as well as using light to destroy this virus. And how come nobody's talking about these solutions? You know, in the mainstream media, everybody's just talking about, oh, wait for the vaccine and wait for the drug. And until then, everybody stayed locked down while the economy crashes and, and people die from, you know, suicides and domestic violence and every, everything else, all, all these insanities that are now emerging across America. But what if we could end all of that in weeks and get America back to work using nutrition and using preventive measures and using light that's what we have to offer here. Anybody from the Trump administration, listen up. This is a solution that can help America get back to work, restore the economy, restore the elections, and put America back on the path where it belongs, which is productivity and health and longevity. So joining me today is Dr. Ed Fatikoff uh, to talk about all of these subjects. Uh, Dr. Eddie or Dr. Fatikoff, how do you prefer uh, I refer to you? And welcome to the show, by the way. Thank you so much for having me. Dr. Eddie, Dr. Fatikoff, whatever's easier. Okay. All right. Dr. Eddie, then. Uh, you're, I, look, we just met today. This is, a, this is an, an urgent situation. You know about this light technology, far UV technology, that may be extremely helpful in sterilizing surfaces and transportation vessels and so on. Why don't you start with a little bit about that, and then I'll ask you more about, about your background later on. But start with the big the big news today, how can light kill this virus? Yeah, so we know that traditional germicidal UVC light that they use in the hospitals, that shiny blue light, purple light that they use that cleans and sterilizes the room can be used to disinfect this. And that's how we're disinfecting the rooms in the hospitals right now with patients that have the coronavirus. What far UVC germicidal light is different from this technology, this is a new innovative technology by a company named Sterile Ray. They have a unique patent on a different wavelength 222 nanometer wavelength that's actually safe in humans and does not penetrate the skin. So this is a game changer in the sense that now you can put these devices on low overhead fixtures and buses and airports and public schools and doctor's offices and public transit. And if we did that, we wouldn't be having uh, such a pandemic in New York City because most of it is caused by the public transport system because okay, people are touching. Really good point. Uh, let me interrupt here just for a second for those watching. Uh, as a full disclaimer, I don't have any involvement in the sterile ray company. I have no financial interest. And I, I think you don't either, right? You're not a partner with the company or anything like that. Is that correct? I, I'm correct. I, I found them because I wanted something in my office to protect my patients so they can feel reassured when they're coming to the office. I'm doing everything I can to keep them safe during this, this COVID-19. So do you, do you use this technology in, in your office right now? Do you have one of these or are they out of stock yeah. everywhere? Well, funny you mention that disney got my last ones so i'm getting mine tomorrow morning and i'll be up and running in the office and what do you, you just place them around the office and they just sterilize the virus as it's blowing past in in the air or how does it work sure so basically if i put it in an exam room like a traditional exam room in a doctor's office i'd put the light up i would turn it on and in about less than three to five minutes the whole room will be sterilized right from the computer to the keyboard to the mouse to the liquid that's in there to the surfaces to the air to everything now, by me doing that, when the patients come in, they know that everything in that room is sterile. And when they leave, we turn it on again, three to five minutes, it's sterile again. That way they can rest assured. Now, since the FDA has not cleared it to have long-term use with humans, uh, we, we turn off the machine in between patients, but it is safe. They've, they've done studies that it is safe in humans and it's safe even to the eyes as well. Well, that's my next question, because we know that UV light can be damaging to the eyes, at least at certain intensities, I think. The, the intensity is what, what matters, and the eyeball functions as an amplifier of light intensity. That's kind of how, how the eyes work. But why is this technology not harmful to the naked eye? That's a question I have. So when they did the studies out of Columbia University, what they realized is that in vivo and in vitro studies, what they realized is that it does not penetrate the first layer of the skin, the dead cells of the skin given the biological wavelength, the 222 wavelength, that specific wavelength does not penetrate human skill or mammalian skin by that way. So that could be your dog, your cat, any type of species out there does not penetrate it, nor does it penetrate the eye. Um, and by doing that, it's safe, but it does penetrate the viruses and the bacteria and the fungus and the parasites. So it can destroy that and inhibit um, their DNA, their structure, and basically make them inactive. 
Okay, so, so 222 nanometers. I think green lasers are known to be harmful to the eye, but they're at, what, 560 nanometers or something like that? And, and red lasers can be harmful at certain intensities, but this is not a laser. It's not a coherent, focused beam of light. It's actually uh, omnipresent, just diffused light the, right. all around the room, correct? Yeah, it's a focused light where it doesn't penetrate the skin, and that's what makes it so safe in front of humans, but bad for bacteria and bad for viruses. Okay. All right, that's interesting. So do you think, I mean, what can the government do right now? Could, could the FDA have emergency approval of this kind of technology to, to treat surfaces and sterilize surfaces? Is that what the company should be asking for? Or what, what's the, what should the government do to help get this out? So I think that the biggest thing we're having right now in the talk, you know, kind of on TV and radio and what people are concerned about, I'm concerned about because, you know, I work in the hospital and I take care of COVID patients is that PPEs, right? Protective devices, have enough masks, have enough N95, regular masks. Or if we're telling or recommending the public, hey, you can get face masks and you can buy them if we if there's a lack of supply. What sterile rate can do, you know, and there, there probably should be studies, but I'm sure it's not too hard to prove, given the fact that the technology can kill all surfaces, they can probably re-sterilize N95 masks, regular masks, gowns, PPEs. So that's something they can implement today to help while there's a shortage. That's how we can use it today. They can also put low level light fixtures, which you'd have to keep it on for 10 minutes. It's not as um, penetrating, you keep it on longer. And that would actually disinfect the whole public transit system in New York City. I mean, they can have this up tomorrow in a week and that way people won't be afraid to take the train. Or if we're saying we're gonna open up the economy, even if it's in a month or two weeks from now, people are still gonna be afraid to ride the trains, they're gonna be right, afraid to do the public transport. People are gonna just have a stigma of, you know, which is good, proper hand uh, hand hygiene and, and doing all these things and wearing masks, but there's still going to be a sense of fear. What if I get it? What if there's a second wave? What if it's going to come back in September? So that's all kind right. of the fear. And, sure that, and, and, sure and what about that. military readiness? Because we've got our battleships or aircraft carriers, excuse me, right now with many sailors who are infected. Submarines are likely to suffer from this. It may be happening right now. The Pentagon, of course, isn't telling us because it's a national security secret. But this could be used on on submarines, you know, airplanes, uh, commercial air flights where passengers no doubt got infected on commercial air flights before that really the whole industry kind of shut down. But shouldn't this be or something like this, shouldn't it be used on airplanes as well? Boeing actually the 737 MAX had part of this technology in their, um, their laboratories, their restrooms. So it would disinfect uh, the whole restroom and the water filtration system. So that was actually part of the rollout with the 737 MAX for some of them. So that technology was going to be used uh, up until last year. So you, that's how I see it. If you could put this all over the air, um, airplanes, inside the airplanes and reassure the public, hey, we've disinfected this whole thing within a matter of seconds to minutes. I mean, it would take like, you know, 80,000 particles, one eighth of a second. I mean, you take five uh, seconds to kill. Dr. Fadikoff, we, we got to go to break. Stay with us, please. I want to ask you about nutrition and zinc and vitamin C and vitamin D on the other side of this. This is Mike Adams here. We'll be back after this short break with more solutions to beat the coronavirus. Coming up today in the next segment, I'm going to talk about how war, war is coming to America. In other words, World War III may be coming to America, and this release of this biological weapon virus may just be the opening chapter of much more yet to come, and what we can do to prepare for that and help support our president and our nation in defending against that possibility. But for this segment, we're continuing our interview with Dr. Eddie Fatikoff, who is, uh, he's into nutrition, he, he treats patients, he understands the healing power of light or how light can sanitize surfaces. And we know that this coronavirus can survive on surfaces up to 17 days, according to some studies, and depending on the surface. Uh, it doesn't survive on metals very long, but it can certainly survive on more porous surfaces, such as cardboard, for much longer. Uh, Dr. Fatikov, let's get into uh, nutrition. And you see patients, you treat patients. Uh, what are you recommending that people do as a general preventive measure right now to reduce their risk of either contracting the virus or uh, in enhancing their body's ability to stop the replication of the virus in their own tissues? What are you recommending? That's a great question. I was actually doing a telemed patient. He just wanted to know what natural things or preventive measures he could do to help with this virus, keep the immune system high. So from all the studies that they're kind of been doing right now and looking at the hot zones and whatnot, vitamin D is probably the biggest thing they should do. Everybody should be on vitamin D minimum 
at least 1250 higher, you know, discuss with your physician. But definitely vitamin D is the biggest thing. Number two, zinc. Like you said, it's cheap. It's effective. Um, it's going to help um, build the immune system. Not only does it help build the immune system, if you're a male, it increases testosterone and other functions of zinc and hair. In addition, vitamin C, they're doing studies right now in Wuhan, China, about high dose IV vitamin C as a therapy for patients with COVID with pneumonia, right? So kind of how we do in cancer patients as well. So high dose vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, probiotics, right? People always forget about probiotics. Probiotics are one of the biggest things I tell all my patients to, to take because that's your immune system right there. Keep that good microbial flora. In addition to, to the supplements, I recommend my patients have a humidifier. The virus hates humidity. It hates 76 degrees or higher. It hates a relative humidity of 35 to 40%. So you were saying the airborne and the surfaces, you can cut the contagion in half just by having the humidity at 35% relative humidity. Is that right? So, yeah, things like that are just quick measures. I mean, think about the instance, if you're in a nursing home or if you're in the hospital, it's usually dry. It's cold, there's no humidity. And so of course the virus in a nursing home can spread more rapidly. And then what happens is those particle size that we talk about, right, for the virus, they go to the lower respiratory tract. They cause a cytokine reaction, inflammatory reaction. The whole system gets overwhelmed. Then you start getting fluid in the lungs. We call that ARDS. And that requires ventilation, uh, mechanical ventilation innovation. Now, if you could have a better uh, immune response and you can have uh, humidity, then what we want to do is decrease the particles so they stay up in the neck and in the throat area. By doing that, you get a mild symptom and that's what they're seeing. The people that get the mild symptoms when they're doing the cultures, the, the actual virus is staying up in the neck, just like the flu, longer. So if it gets the lower respiratory tract right away and you have no defenses, those are the people that you see that are young and healthy, boom, they need a ventilator right away. Why? They have no medical problems. You know, they have sinus problems, they have asthma. Those are the questions we need to ask because when they say that in the news, my question is, did he have a history of seasonal allergies? Uh, did he have, you know, runny, bleeding noses? I mean, things that we don't know because they're not going to provide the medical history on the, um, on the news. So we don't know right. those 40-year-old, 20-year-old. What, in your opinion, how long would it take a person to bring up their blood serum levels of things like vitamin D3 as well as zinc? I mean, can that happen literally overnight or does it take a few days or what's your take? So vitamin D, especially, um, you know, I, I treat um, integrative specialists, internists, but I also do weight loss. They're really resistant, right? So those patients are overweight or obese and need high doses of vitamin D and it takes actually a little bit longer to get the concentration. Uh, in terms of zinc, um, you know, the best way to get it in there is IV, right? So IV nutrition therapy, but if you can't, the supplements, I usually recommend 80 milligrams or more. You know, if you're somebody that's immunocompromised, you can take double that. And it depends what form of zinc do you take. Do you take the gluconate, the citrate, the piconolate, which seems more effective to increase absorption. So um, taking something is better than not doing anything, right? If you're if you're kind of cognizant saying, I'm going to do something for my immune system. But also think about it like this as antioxidant, right? We're, the CDC recommends taking a multivitamin, you know, stress reduction, not be stressed out, decrease anxiety. Well, if people are watching the news and they're panicking and they're not and their gyms are closed, they're not working out, their anxiety is up. Well, that's going to increase stress, which we don't want. So things like, you know, something like 5-HTP or we talk about melatonin, things that can decrease stress, improve sleep, improve quality of life. All those things boost your immune system. So the fact that you're young and healthy, but you're only sleeping two hours a night because you're anxious, having panic attacks by the coronavirus, well, that weakens and hampers your immune system. So you're not doing yourself any good or any favors by not getting enough sleep or by having heightened anxiety during this time. So you're, you're, you deal with a lot of patients who come to you for weight loss, correct? Uh, people yeah. who are suffering from obesity. Now, uh, obesity, as I understand it, is a very strong comorbidity factor for uh, case fatality rates related to coronavirus. Um, is that because, in your view, is obesity often tied to the same kind of nutritional deficiencies that we're, we're covering here that create vulnerability to the virus? Or is there something else in parallel going on? What's, what's your take on the ties between obesity and COVID-19, in other words? Well, obesity is a disease and it was labeled disease in 2013. So just like blood pressure, which increases mortality, just as cardiovascular disease, obesity is a disease and you can have a hampered immune response to it, a weaker immune system. That's one. Two, the types of diets or foods you eat in the person who's obese or morbidly obese and the hormonal things, right? So there's a lot of factors that go into place, but you're right. And with obesity, you have what we call you know, certain syndromes, right? You can have high blood pressure, sleep apnea, high cholesterol. There's a lot of associations with the joint pain, which causes inflammation. So they've even done the studies on patients that were obese or when they saw the virus, 
increased inflammatory markers, right, that we get in blood draws, like a CRP, C-reactive protein. And they're saying that's in, that's actually increased in those patients that are obese because of the joint pain and whatnot. So my whole thing is anything you can do, it's a disease. Obesity, just like blood pressure, just like any other condition that can lower your immune system is a disease, and you're at increased risk. Is is zinc supplementation and vitamin D supplementation those two of the key things that you start with obese patients uh, to, to boost their nutrition and maybe reduce the inflammatory response? Yeah, so um, I start my patients because they've done a lot of studies, whether it's fecal transplant studies or they've done studies on weight loss and probiotics, right? So probiotics is the first thing I start because it'll help them lose weight and boost their immune system. Second thing I start because I do integrated medicine is vitamin D. Vitamin D is crucial. Uh, that's why the sunlight helps, right? So when people say, you look at the hot zones where the coronavirus is, the places where it's really hot and really humid, there's not as many cases reported. And you could say, is it the population area? I could say it relates to the sun. Now, how is the sun beneficial in preventing the coronavirus? It's not the actual sun rays that people talk about. It's the vitamin D that they're getting. And all the studies coming out in terms of immunity for coronavirus, the biggest one thing you can do is vitamin D. That's probably the best evidence for the coronavirus is vitamin D you could do. They, there are some medications that are investigational. They're talking about interleukin-6 inhibitors. And one thing that can naturally block the interleukin-6 that, you know, if you can't afford it or if it's not a, um, an option right now, and they've done studies, is curcumin, right, turmeric. So that's something that's a powerful anti-inflammatory that um, can hurt, can only help, I think, in my opinion, based on the prelim studies. Obviously, there's been no studies on curcumin and coronavirus, but it's something that can inhibit inflammation in patients. Well, that's, that's something that I take every day. Uh, give us, a, I, I understand you've authored a few books. Give us a couple book titles or give us a website where people can find out more about your work. And you're based in Georgia, is that correct? Yeah, Atlanta. Okay, Atlanta. Okay, so uh, give yeah, we got about a minute left. Give us a little bit of, of how people can find out about you. Thank you so much. It's uh, www.drfatikoff.com or www.eddiefatikoff.com. And that's F A T A K H O V. Like okay. Your coffee, man. And then I got have uh, plenty of. Uh, you could download probably two of my books there for free. My newest book, The Doctor Fat Off: Simple Lifelong Solutions, is right behind you, and. Um, you know, and I basically just teach people how to live a healthy life, not a not a fad diet, not something that they're going to have to do, lose 20 pounds and get back on another diet. You know, it's more practicality. And then the Doctors Clinic 30 program, uh, we actually published that research in International Journal of Obesity, and it's a proven program. And I co-author that with uh, JT Cooper, and that, that's the fourth edition. It's that first right, one was published back in May. Thank you, Dr. Fadikoff. Sorry to cut, cut you off there, but uh, we're, okay. we're going to break. I appreciate your time on the show. You've got good advice for people. Stay with us, folks. We'll talk about World War III on the other side of this, but that was Dr.